Welcome to our series on the chakras. So as we learned from our previous series on working with the chi and the meridians, we know that the life force runs through the meridians, but there is a strong interaction also with the chakras. First of all, let's define a little bit what a chakra is. A chakra is a place in the body where a certain type of energy is more concentrated. So the same type of energy is all over the body, but it is most strongly concentrated in that one spot. And also in this spot is where it has its interaction with the outside world. So by definition, a chakra is a portal between the inside world, what is within the body, and what is outside of the body. So you can look upon it as a little bit as a, a trading post, you could say, where certain energies are uh, allowed to leave and certain energies are allowed to enter. And every trading post is trading in a different good, you could say. So it is very much that every chakra has its own types of energy, its own frequency, its own vibration, which it is dealing with. So rather than um, absorbing the whole spectrum of energies through one chakra, we absorb, you could say, every color of the spectrum, like red, uh, orange, yellow, green, light blue, dark blue and purple, in several, several chakras. Certain chakras are more wide in the types of energies they can handle and the types of frequencies they can handle. For instance, the hand chakras are very much multi-purpose chakras, which can work with a variety of different energies. But most chakras are very specific. Many people are familiar with the Vedic system of chakras, um, which is also a quite complex system. But what many people know are the seven personality chakras. But the Vedic system also recognizes many other chakras, uh, which are on the hands, on the elbows, in the shoulders, in the lungs, um, along the esophagus. And there are also other chakra systems. Uh, there are also Native American chakra systems, both North American Indians and uh, South American Indians also have chakra systems, and all, all these systems also range from very simple, having only four chakras, to very complex. In the Middle American tradition they have more than a hundred chakras. And every chakra, again, connects to a very specific different energy. So, working with chakras can be very complex and it can be very precise. But, in general, people work on the personality. So they work with the seven main chakras and not so much with all the other supportive chakras. Uh, these supportive chakras can be very important because they allow us to feel our environment, to also absorb energy, absorb life force from our environment, uh, from the air we breathe, from the scents we smell, from the things we eat, from the things we drink, and even from the, the stones around us, the, the sea, the river, um, the mountains. So these supportive chakras are also of big importance, uh, but in general they're paid less attention to. One other reason is also if all goes well, they autonomous, autonom autonomously will deal with it. So they have a very specific task to release energies which are no longer needed, to absorb energies which are needed, and in this way they just um, generate life force out of the environment. They filter it out. And just like breathing or the heartbeat, uh, it is very important that you breathe, it's very important that your heart beats, but you tend to not to think about it too much, not to worry about it too much, not to work with it too much. Because if all is well, it will just function perfectly, without any further care. 
And it is the same with all our supportive chakras. They tend to follow the lead of the main chakras. And it is usually when we move to a very different environment. So there can be, um, if you grew up in a place which is in the mountains and you move to a place which is in the swamps, for instance, then it can be that your environmental chakras are not really attuned to the difference in energy. And then it might become necessary to work with that. Also, if you want to manifest very specific energies, for instance, if you start performing magic, then it can be very important that these chakras which have to manifest these specific energies are in very good condition, that they are attuned to exactly the energy you wish to manifest. Um, so then it becomes important to develop and to fine-tune these chakras. But if you're not involved in magic and you're in a way more or less uh, comfortable in your living environment and in your work environment, there's generally not that much need to, uh, to work with these chakras. We will go more into these supportive chakras in, uh, in later parts of the course, but for now I want to focus a little bit on the main chakras. So I've already described the colors. So from the bottom you have uh, the base chakra at the base of the spine, which is red in color. Above that, slightly below the navel, we have the second chakra, which is orange in color. Around the stomach, you have the third chakra, which is yellow. Then you have the heart chakra. The heart chakra is green. The throat chakra, which is at the base of the throat, is light blue, more or less sky blue. Then you have a deep dark blue for the third eye or the forehead chakra and the crown chakra is purple. These colors are indications of what it should look like if your whole chakra system is healthy and balanced. In reality you will find that the colors are not always um, that pure. There might be other colors mixed in to uh, other chakras. Because if one chakra is very dominant, it may start to overrule other parts of your being. So for instance, if I'm very programmed, and uh, my throat chakra is very strong, and I want to behave in a good way, I want to be a good boy, live up to expectations, then this chakra will start to modulate all other chakras. And they will ultimately uh, create a kind of a pollution in all these other chakras because the other chakras cannot do what they want to do anymore. They have to do what this chakra wants to do. It can also be an opposite thing. So it can be that the light blue invades other chakras because this is a very dominant chakra. But it can also be that this is a very repressed chakra and the energy cannot manifest in a natural way. So it has to manifest through other channels. So, for instance, if this chakra is very blocked, I'm not able to express my feelings, my emotions, I'm not able to communicate very well, and that might mean that the only way to communicate for me is through love, through emotion, or uh, through the third chakra, through action, or telepathically, through the higher chakras. And then you also find that because of the blockage here, the energy tends to find other ways out. So if we find out that a chakra is not pure in color, that is usually a good indication that there is some kind of an imbalance somewhere. So there's different stories about what chakras look like, what they uh, should feel like. And the two most common ones are actually treating the chakras as uh, wheels, more or less like cog wheels. And every chakra is rotating. And in this theory, a chakra either has a rotation clockwise or a rotation counterclockwise. And there's many theories on 
how fast they should rotate and also the rhythm of their rotation. So how many rotations clockwise before they start going counterclockwise. So three clockwise, three counterclockwise, three clockwise, three counterclockwise. So these are ways of measuring if a chakra is balanced or unbalanced. Another method, and this is for me a preferable method, is to envision chakras like flowers. And um, the chakra can be closed like a flower, which is yeah, also closing like a bud. And when a chakra is feeling well, then just like a flower, it will open itself up. And similarly to flowers, the chakra can be seen as having petals. And the pattern of these petals can be very regular, very healthy, or it can be irregular with some dead leaves in there which is also showing some damage to the chakra. For me the flower method of visualization of chakras is a little bit more informative than the wheel method. But people can use any type of imagery they like to uh, create an image which to them explains how the chakra is doing. Uh, it's important also to note that the chakra is neither a flower nor a wheel, it is basically just an energy in another dimension. Um, but since we have no um, direct perception of that other dimension, often the brain needs to create some kind of a model uh, to comprehend the energy, to translate the energy into something, some concept we can work with, which is usually either the wheel or the flower. Um, the shape of chakras, for people who um, can see them or feel them, it tends to be a little bit of a, of a trumpet shape. So it tends to be a little bit narrow, usually about two inches uh, when it is on the body. And it widens out, it's usually about um, 30 centimeters, so it can be 20, it can be 40 centimeters, but these are typical chakra sizes and how far it goes outside of the body and it tends to uh, be more or less cone shaped so the end of the chakra is more white than the base of the chakra so this is a typical normal chakra shape but of course depending on circumstances chakras can change shape they can move left they can move right they can move up they can move down they can widen, they can narrow, and also they can become shorter or longer. But these are all differences we will get into when we will discuss how to work with chakras, how to treat any abnormalities of chakras. So there's a lot of things to, to think about. Uh, the purity of the color, uh, the size of the chakra, the shape of the chakra, um, so a chakra can tell us quite a lot, but we have to find out all these different things um, generally one by one. So it is good in the beginning not to try to know everything, to see a chakra as a whole. Like I want to see what shape it is, what, how much energy it has, how quick it is circulating, as you could see by the movement of the wheels, how healthy the structure is, is it damaged by seeing all the petals. Um, just try to pick one method until you're comfortable with that and once you are able to perceive chakras accurately in that manner start to add other ways, other methods of looking at the chakra. So every uh, method you could say is like a theory and every theory explains part of what the chakra does or how it is functioning or malfunctioning. But no theory exists, to my knowledge, which actually covers the entirety of the chakra. So this is why we have to work with several theories to explain the different aspects of the chakra. So, thank you for listening to this introduction. And I'll go a little bit more into detail about the first and the second chakra in the next video.